Welcome to the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 139. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Welcome back to the Veterinary Project Podcast. You are joined by Dr. Michael Bug, Dr. Jonathan Light on what is going to be a very interesting episode. It's just the two of us today. Mike, how are you doing? Doing well, Johnny. Interesting. Good choice of words. Random, probably. We shall see. So this is wrapping the year. We thought, hey, no guest, just hit record. Let's roll. Where are you taking us today? Well, it's been a bit since we've done this. We have been through the gamut of themes over the last couple of weeks of what we were going to do. It did start off with potentially looking at different areas in the world from a crystal ball perspective. We're going to ixnay that. We're not going to do that. We're going to go into 2024 today, and we're going to look at where are we spending our time, energy, and perhaps some predictions in certain specific areas. Hopefully, Mike's smiling right now, which is great because he was grumpy bum coming into this podcast conversation today. So I think we're already in a better tune to bring in value to our listeners. Here's where our thoughts are today on the way of the world as it looks for Mike and Johnny. Yeah. And I'll take responsibility. I x the crystal ball because I was like, Jonathan, no one knows. Every time I've tried to predict something of any sort, it's just like, well, I was wrong. You know, so like you can do your best and maybe make some probabilities and generalizations. But I always get a little bit, what do they say on social media? You should have a very definitive point of view, even if it's wrong. And I'm like, ah, I don't really subscribe to that. I don't know. As you said, crystal balls age badly. And so we're not going to go completely there, but I am going to try and get you on a soap opera today because I think we can get there. So as we came into this conversation, let's get this started. I think it's really interesting. We're in December, 2023. There's a lot happening right now. You perhaps weren't on your happiest game coming into this conversation. Tell us a little bit more why. Not the details, but what's happening in Mike's world these days? Oh, I was only grouchy because I just got off with the meeting with an accountant doing year-end taxes and year-end taxes Gosh. suck. I mean, we're, we're not spending much time on it. No one wants to hear about taxes. It's just the necessary evil of running investments and businesses. That's why I wanted to go there. And I think you're completely right is that I did mine on Wednesday and I've got a couple of different companies and they have different year ends. And what they don't tell you on social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, is the actual work that's behind the scenes needed to keep it all together, whether it's corporation, taxes, accountants, lawyers, et cetera. Nobody ever shows that. And yet it's real and it's hours of getting it. So I'm really excited, but in the veterinary world, all the veterinary professionals that are looking to go into ownership had a number of conversations in the past three months with some young, talented, I think, aggressive vets that are going to do great things in this space. Just be aware of the other side because it also exists, right? Yeah. There's experts for that. We have to compile the data and get the account and the data. And we were going through his list of questions. And I remember one of them, you know, he goes through the big preamble and I just looked at him and I was like, you're the expert, man. Just tell me what to do. That's why we're having this meeting. Like you tell me this way or that way, that's what we're doing. I've said this before. I think of it when people come into the vet clinic, you know, and sure you have to chat with them. You got to figure out where they're at. What are they looking for? But there does come a point where they typically will look at you and be like, what do we do here? I'm big on just finding those experts, put them around you and then trust them. That's where the value is. That's where the money is. And then in my situation, I've gone through as an example in my personal business is different lawyers, but I've had to fire a lawyer before where you're going, the value's not there and or potentially the expectations on both sides of the table are different. Well, let's have that conversation. And if it can't work, it can't work. And that's having the team around you. Because like you said, 
they're the pros in that area. They're supposed to be just as we are in the vet space. Yep. Yeah. It's a good yeah. one. So taxes, getting them complete, have a smile back on the face and then get into the Christmas season. As you look, Mike, into 2024, you've got some big goals for the next year, both personal and professional. Take us down one of those roads and then we'll see where it can swerve as we, in our discussion. Where do you want to spend your time and attention and how could it relate to what we do on the podcast potentially? I'm going to skip the health garden, not because it's not a big goal, just because we've talked about it a lot. On finance and investing, I'll say the last year, so as everyone knows, interest rates skyrocketed maybe is for lack of a better word, but it was really the pace of change, right? Where we went from a 0.25% lending environment and double digit number of interest rate increases. And it has really rocked the boat in the real estate world, in the stock market world, for those of you that invest there. And what I'm seeing is like, there's still uncertainty. For me and my family, we are taking more of an approach in 2024. I still certainly want to grow but I am playing a lot more defense than normal. I'll steal from you. You like to talk about seasons of life, but I look at like in my investing journey, there's times where I go on offense and there's times where I'm playing more defense. I tend to always look defensively at my portfolio, but especially in 2024, you know, it's making sure things are running tight, watching your expenses. I'm sure our listeners can relate. The cost of seemingly everything has gone up dramatically. I look at what can I control and then it's boring, but line by line through the businesses, through the properties and trying to see where can you get those expenses down? Where can we move revenue a little bit in some of the mastermind groups I'm a part of? This is a poor mindset to focus this way, but the saying is survive till 2025. Yeah. So serious. That's interesting. That is interesting. You made a couple of points there of going line by line. What does that mean within the context of your businesses or family, Mike? Well, I mean, to be honest, Rosalie and I used to budget like religiously to the dollar, right? We had a spreadsheet, every expense comes in, all the income comes in and savings and investing and emergency fund and all that. And we were excellent. Like we had very good financial habits. And then as we were growing, you know, and our revenue started to outpace our expenses by a decent amount, we kind of were like, you know, this isn't really a good use of time. Like we don't need to track every expense. We know that we're doing the right moves generally. So let's drop it. But we're actually going to pick that back up just to like get another snapshot, make sure there's no leaks, make sure, you know, everything is tight. So that's not meant to be coming from a scarcity standpoint. It's just, you know, you don't know what you don't know and what you measure improves. So we just want to make sure we have a handle on that. And then more in the property investment side, I mean, no different than running a vet clinic. You know, you have different expenses. So whether insurance, property tax, utilities, water, anything. I mean, some of them are out of your control. You can take insurance, for example. You can go to work with a broker and you can shop that out to multiple different insurance companies. But I mean, at the end of the day, you got to go with one of them. And if they're all up 20%, 30%, well, that expense is going to be up 20 or 30%. Agreed. Oh, I'm just smiling and giggling while you're saying this because it's so true on both the personal and the professional measure. We've not even talked about this. Candice and I, we did a sit down here. It was a good month and a half ago and same thing. Went through our net worth statement where we were line by line, literally line by line. And it was such a good reminder of what you measure is what you can gauge and improve on. You said it yourself is perfect. We've been doing the same thing within Mosaic. Mosaic and Bridgeline, they work a little bit differently in terms of the clinics because Bridgeline still in a real big growth phase. So we're adding and adding where we have another VOA starting on Monday. And I think that will be employee number 19 for us already far surpassing where we thought at a time, but we have to continue to grow. That's the demand. And that's what it's asking for on the mosaic side. We've been doing this the last three months is going line by line. And you mentioned in a vet operation setting, I just wrote a couple down there, insurance, phone systems, payment processing, utilities, thousands upon thousands of dollars of reviewable expenses to be saved, especially when you do have brokers and a team involved that can help you navigate the negotiations and or just point holes in your providers because you want to continue relationships with them. But if they are 20% up, well, let's have a discussion about what's there. And there's thousands of dollars to be had so that that money is staying in the clinic where it needs to be for recruitment, retention, all these pieces that are 
going to be extremely important in 2024. Yeah. That to me is exciting. It's exciting for the team too, because they're easy wins so that then we can focus on the really important pieces that are our team, revenue, clients, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's not glamorous, but everyone really, no. I would recommend it personal business all across the board, you know, subscriptions. Yeah. How many subscriptions do you have? When you start looking and you're like, oh, holy, course. I'm still getting, I still pay for that every month. I haven't opened it in eight months. I can cancel that one. We did that about three months ago, actually, both personally and professionally. Personally, we cut a number out. And again, we didn't have a lot. So we're talking two, but professionally, same thing. It's really easy. Yeah, 20 bucks here, 40 bucks here. And holy heck, does that add up for things that you don't use enough to make it worthwhile? Darn right. Yeah. yeah. 2024, I would say for myself, I'm a little bit different than you, Mike, in terms of the philosophy. I would say I'm being a little bit more opportunistic. I see some opportunities mm -hmm. in the market where we're probably going to double down in some areas where I'd say the market is no longer frothy in the vet space and allows for some opportunity to both retain talent that wasn't there before, but also look at opportunities where in the vet space, there's opportunity to expand. I'd say that's something that a year or two was only with the VCAs, vet strategies, consolidators, but a number of those consolidators aren't doing anything now. And again, in certain circumstances, we've also had to retract as well, but definitely opportunities available. Yeah. Yep. That I kind of want to clarify, just so I don't give the wrong impression. I will still be looking to expand, but it will be very cautiously and looking for that opportunity. And I mean, do we dare? Do we throw out the dreaded R word in 2024? Is that coming? I know we said we're not supposed to have crystal ball predictions, but the macro and the micro all state recessions on the way if it's not already there. Yeah. I mean, you and I, I guess we've experienced sort of 2008, 2009, you know, we were still in vet school, so we weren't really in the business world yet. And then previous to that, the tech bubble 2000, we didn't experience. I mean, we were too young, like we were alive, obviously, but we didn't experience it. So what I saw I'm it in told, the oil, oil and gas though, for us, sorry to cut in oil and gas for us, 2015 through 17, it yeah. hit us hard, Western yeah. Canada. Yep. And I guess what I would say is the mentors I surround myself with, and when you come into these turbulent times, the opportunities that do present themselves can be large and life-changing. So it is important to not just go hide under a rock and hope to wake up in 2026, because there will be big opportunities that present themselves, but you have to be prepared to move on them. Agreed. Let's switch gears a little bit. Having fun in 2024. You and I, we're not 20 anymore. What was having fun in 20 is not the same as having fun in 40. What's it look like for 2024 within the Mike household? What are you going to do to have fun and put a smile on the face? What's that look like? This is going to be the most boring answer in the podcast. You should have prepped this. It's like a lawyer. You don't ask a question. You don't know the answer to. I don't know it. Well, the first half of the year is just get that renovation done. So we're in that midst of a huge renovation. So, I mean, we're not going anywhere. Our trips are to the house to renovate. So that's Next not door. very fun, yep. but it will be excellent. The environmental change will be amazing. You know, when that's complete and we move in and we have the space and the environments that we're looking to create the different rooms in the house. So that's what we're looking forward to the most. And that's so exciting for you guys. You've been wanting to do that for the last decade here now, right? So big changes yeah. for you in 2023 and they're only going to get better 2024. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Yep. I just hey. told you before, I was like, Mike, we're off to Japan. He's like, what? <laughs> so yeah, that's our fun for the start of uh, 2024 is that Candace and I just booked a trip last week with the family and the four of us, were going to head off to Japan, which I'm quite excited about. So we've started down the path of Duolingo and figuring out what the heck, how to speak Japanese and quite excited about it. That's drop, sure. drop some Japanese on us. Let's not. I do not want to embarrass Come myself on. more than I already do on this podcast. So I'm going to refrain for a month or two. Okay. So we're going to do that end of February, minimal conference needs over the next few months. So really focus on operations within Mosaic, Bridgeland, and then take a couple of weeks off, which then brings me into the next set that I had in this conversation is vacation time. I've been doing some looking back on 2023, and it's interesting. I think I failed miserably in 2023 to actually take some downtime. And it's December now, and wow, can I feel it. And I was reviewing definitions of what downtime is versus vacation time. And they're actually two different things. I'm interested to get your take because I think you're a lot better than this than I am. 
At Christmas, I'm going to take a week off where we actually have no plans outside of going for hockey, maybe do some skiing. We're not traveling. We're not doing anything like that. And I think that'll be my first downtime all year. You're way better at this. How do you differentiate the two, vacation and downtime? Or do you? To be honest, I never thought of it to that degree. I mean, vacation would be generally we're traveling somewhere. Even when I vacation, though, I don't book it wall to wall. Like, I've just never liked that, right? I'm not that kind of person that, you know, if I'm gone for a week, every day is full of activities that are pre-booked. I might book one or two things, but generally I keep a lot of open time. So, I mean, downtime, we do have a lot of that. For us, that'll just yeah. be keep trying to keep the weekend open. I think that is important coming into the holiday season. I see a lot of people that their holiday season is not a holiday at all. It's a calendar that's got 27 hours a day booked of various obligations and activities. I know you can see me looking at you, but you just live a more fast paced lifestyle. Like I like that wide open day. You know, what are we doing? I don't know. Whatever we decide to do today, that's what we're doing. I don't remember the last time we had that. Actually, I think Jack and I had that for three hours last Sunday. I was like, this is amazing. Where we just punched around, I think worked on something, watched a Netflix show because we had Netflix for a little bit. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah man. Then we yeah. said we better get to hockey. And that's because we had hockey at 7.30 in the morning. But no, that's cool. I really like both ends of it. I could pretend that I'd want the downtime that you have, but for some reason it it hasn't been something I've consciously gone towards. So it's my own fault. Yeah. No, that's all good. Excellent. Books, 2024 books or current readings that you're in the middle of that should be shared with the crew. The podcast listeners are like, what is Mike up to? I am, I'm not going to say the name of this one because it'll give away a podcast guest that I'm lining up for next year. But mm. anyone who's really listened intently, it's my number one book of all time. But I'm rereading it and I'm going to, we're hoping to have the author on this podcast early in 2024. So stay tuned for that. I am rereading. If he's he's listening, then please come on. Well, it's not a he. That'll be my own. Okay. I'm rereading The Road Less Stupid. I think that's Keith Cunningham. Just it's come up quite a few times in my mastermind group, in my pod, on other podcasts about how good that book is. I probably first read it three or four years ago. So I'm due for a renew on that. Other than that, The Psychology of Money, my pod group is going through that. That's a great book, especially coming back to our finance chats we had here to start this episode. If you're budgeting and whatnot, Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel is must-read material. Nice. The first book that you mentioned, I've not heard you talk about that one. Just in very brief, what makes it a reread in your opinion? The Road Less Stupid? Yeah. Just good business principles. And one of his core concepts or the core concept is thinking time. Mm. And so this is funny because we obviously haven't prepped this, but like going into what we just said, you are go, 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 go. And lots of what he will say is as a business owner and CEO, you have to block time to think right? And safeguard that. So that means you're not on your phone scrolling where Instagram is telling you what to think about. It's just you. He has a bunch of prompts, really good questions to guide each of your thinking time. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I mean, that's my style as a real estate investor. I spent a lot of time on strategy and thinking and, you know, trying to make the right investment. So it's up my alley. That's excellent. Okay. I'm going to have a read of it. And I know one of the tools that I implemented probably July of this year is putting in focus time into my calendars and it's made a big difference. Yep. Month ahead, having focus time scheduled in. And then I'm a little bit more conscious on what goes into that focus time. So I have agenda items listed out and it is done very well for execution. So I'd agree with that. I'm going to have a good listen. One book I brought up here. I've Love books and one that I've been reading, and this is a slow read because it's one that I'm actually reading a few pages in the morning. We have one of those lights, and I sorry, I cannot remember the name of it now, but it's one of those lights that you use at the darker times of the year. This is in essence to try and get more of that natural light into your retinas and really setting up for right mood, right intention of the day. And this book that I've been reading is called The Courage to Be Disliked, Shiro Kashimi and Fumitaki Koga. And I'm sorry, I could be mispronouncing it. Great book. I think one of the quotes here in the product descriptions, I think is fantastic is from Mark Andreessen, who's a venture capitalist, founder of Andreessen Horowitz. 
And his quote is, this book is, and Lyrian philosophy meets Stoic philosophy in Socratic dialogue, compelling from front to back and highly recommended. And this is going through an alternative mode of philosophy, which relates all to interpersonal communication. So how do we communicate with others in our world with ourselves? How do we view ourselves, morale, and dealing with the day-to-day presence that is conflict and everything else. And it really is a philosophy book, but it's written in a way that is a story between a philosopher and a young man that's come to him, not believing in the philosophy and asking a whole bunch of questions. So it provides for a lot more interesting dialogue and I really enjoyed it. It's one of the books where I'm taking notes as I go and underwriting and highlighting and we'll be reading it again. It makes you think. So For me, this has been a really nice wake up over the last month and a half reading it. And it's a short read. It's probably a couple hundred pages. So this is The Courage to Be Disliked. And then they have a second book called The Courage to Be Liked. Very interesting. It is. So a little bit more philosophy, gain a little bit more wisdom and understand where we're coming from. That's what that book's about. The other side of it, though, is, and I'll bring this one up because I also do audio books at length and this art. So are audible. Gentlemen, I do like a little bit of fantasy when I really have to get away and don't want to think about what's going on in the day to day. And this is usually in the evenings on my way back from work here and taking a little time away. Joe Abercrombie, amazing writer. Again, if I was reading this book in paper version, the number of quotes that this author comes up with is unbelievable. Just genius writing in a fantasy novel setup. Fantastic. So I'm on the third of three books. And yeah, just the quality of writing is fantastic, especially in a fantasy setup. So for anybody that Joe Abercrombie, amazing fantasy novel setups, and I'm looking forward to reading to his next trilogy. Never heard of him, but I mean, I trust you. I probably I shouldn't either. venture over yep. there more. Yeah, it had come over from, I think this one was another podcaster that I listened to. Don't have a lot of time to listen to him these days. I try and listen to good podcasts in the morning on the way to work. And then I try and have a little relaxation on the way home ahead of getting home so that's where this one comes from right on man changing gear a little bit isaiah douglas i went back and forth with him former podcast guest he is a bitcoin maximalist he has his own podcast which is fantastic in the veterinary space talking all things bitcoin we went back and forth because we're making a couple changes on our podcast right now and checked out the latest on the bitcoin price this week have you? I'm looking at you. Oh, you're asking me. Sorry. Yeah, it skyrocketed. It's super interesting because in the Twitter world, Bitcoin and Ethereum and FTT and everything else was dead for the longest time. And I don't get onto Twitter too often or X as it's now called. And holy heck, I opened it up in the last two weeks and it's Bitcoin to the moon and FOMO this and FOMO that. And I went, oh, everybody's back again. Looks like Bitcoin's hot. So I looked it up and Again, I have a little bit of money in there, not too much. And 155% increase in the last year, year to date. When I'd say it's up. Everybody's coming out of the woodwork again. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 2024. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not the guy to ask. I follow it a little bit. There's The halving is coming in 2024, which I guess should make price go up. But I mean, I'm not going to tell people one way or another. All I would say is on the psychology of things is with Bitcoin beware of FOMO, right? When things are skyrocketing Mm -hmm. and everyone piles in, there could be some recipe for disaster there. And then I would look at time horizon. Isaiah may have different thoughts on this, but I would personally only be comfortable putting money into Bitcoin that I don't need for a long time so that I can ride the ups and the downs because the volatility is wild. That's just my two cents. Agreed. And for anybody who wants to know, neither Mike and I are self-proclaimed specialists or understand Bitcoin or any of those ends, but the Veterinarian Success Podcast, that's Isaiah Douglas's podcast. He has a number of guests on there that are financial advisors, et cetera, related to Bitcoin and altcoins and all things veterinary success. So worth checking out. And I you know him and I were going back and forth this week and went, whew, that number has increased a lot. 2024, Mike, as we come to an end and wrap on this, we've had some Super cool guests this fall, and I am excited to see what 2024 comes in here. A number of comments that have come our way, and again, I've not prepped this to you ahead of time, is 
us diversifying our guests and who we have on. The two of us had Emily Singler, Singler on talking about pregnancy in the veterinary space. And it's interesting. I've had a number of individuals reach out and say, kudos for you guys for going down a topic that you are obviously not comfortable with. So what do you mean? It's like, it took about 30 seconds to listen to you on the podcast to know. And I was like, thanks. I appreciate that. We do want to go into spaces that traditionally have not been talked about in veterinary medicine. That was one of them. And we've got some more coming on the way, right? Yeah, we have some recordings next week and then they won't come out for a month or two, probably. There's a few that I am very excited for. I mean, we haven't recorded yet, so I don't really know what we're going to talk about with them, but I know who we're chatting with. And there will be some very thought-provoking episodes that come out that probably make the listeners go, huh, and have some really deep questions about life, you know? And that's the fun part. Absolutely. So there might be some oh shit moments. I hope there is actually. Yeah. I'm really excited about the one guest there that, again, you've known for a, a number of years here and have followed his work, et cetera. I'm excited to see what he does on this podcast. Me too. Yep. Excellent. Well- that's okay, it one, for my list. One second. Okay. I know I said we're not crystal balling it, but let's crystal ball a little bit. What do you see 2024 veterinary industry? I am curious too, because I mean, you're in it, multiple clinics every day. You see the flow, you see the client flow. What's the trend? And then if we extrapolate, maybe not a crystal ball prediction, but what would be some game theory probabilities of what we can expect in 2024. Oh, there's so much involved in that, Mike. Um, Here, and I'll give you time to think. I'll tell you some of my thoughts and keeping in mind just for our listeners, like I'm not in a vet clinic. I don't own a vet clinic. I'm not seeing, you know, number of cases a day, clients coming in. I'm going strictly off of people I talk to and just the feel in the world right now. And it feels like people are starting to tighten up, but Pets are family members, right? So when they need care, they're going to get care. Yeah. But I'm curious, I wonder about, does some of that prevention care maybe slip? If people are trying to watch their own personal budget, you know, are you starting to see that show up at the veterinary clinics or is it still full steam ahead? All right. I'll caveat this, that it is very regionally specific. So individuals in North America, I chat with some are in great shape and it's busy and demand is there. There are other areas where there's gaps in schedules now that there hasn't been since pre-COVID. I think personally that will continue into 2024 where there is still demand. And as you said, pets are part of the family. The veterinary industry is healthy from the standpoint of a supply or I mean of a demand perspective. Supply in terms of veterinarians, again, not everybody agrees. That's fine. You asked me my crystal ball. We still have a veterinary shortage in many areas that is affecting the ability to meet that demand. From a standpoint of value, I think there is still a lot of opportunities for improvement in the veterinary space to be able to provide even more value for our clients in terms of the efficiencies, what we're doing at individual clinic level, both the services that are provided, providing more services that are available through RVTs if there aren't the DVMs available. And even if there are other things that RVTs that are able to do within their licensing realm, I think we're still in early days on that end. Clinic visits are down in multiple areas. This isn't me saying that. That's the research showing for the analytic tools that are being used. But with the visits being down, people are still spending more, which is interesting. So the average invoice is up this year, even though the clinic visits are down. I think 2024 as it should be, should continue to be all around retention, team, communication. That's our focus within Mosaic and Bridgeland is ensuring that you're not coming across. You know, numbers are important. Without a doubt, we're in an operating environment. I'll say that over and over again, but it's more about, it's more than that. It's what's your core values? What are you about? Do you have something that differentiates you from the rest that are out there? I'm really excited about that opportunity because we're still early days and if we get that right, our clients are going to see that. Our team is going to see that. And I think there's a huge opportunity. So we're going to continue yeah. to try and grow it within our own. And that takes a lot of different ways to do it. Okay. I have another tough question, putting you totally on the spot. I didn't prep this. Do you think we will see pricing coming down? Like, so pick whatever line item you want to pick, a dog spay at whatever weight category, or just a normal clinic exam. 
do you see like 2024, 2025, any scenario where the vet clinics will start charging less for those? Soapbox time. Oh, yes. Do it. Veterinary business is not a general business, meaning one rule cannot apply for all. In my view, from a simplistic standpoint, for general practice only, you can be high volume, low cost, or you can be higher cost, lower volume, and quality proactive care. It depends on what business you're in. And those are two different businesses with different top line revenues that will come in and different bottom line expectations. I am not in the high volume, low cost business. If you want to be there, fantastic. It's not what I aspire to be as a veterinarian or a veterinary professional and nor any of our businesses. As a result, we do have costs that are a little bit higher. And as a result, we also have value that we provide for our clients that is, I think, in a better pace. I'm not a fan of 15-minute appointments. I'm not a fan of 20-minute appointments. I try not to have any of those in any of our clinics because I don't think there's enough value provided to the clients. There's not enough education to be able to be provided. There's not enough opportunity to sell and or to be involved in the discussions that are needed around nutrition, parasiticides, blood work, proactive feline care, proactive senior care, all these items that take time and are of value to the client that's coming in to spend money. So if you're only charging 60, 50, 40, $30 to have that, what kind of value are you providing for? So my answer to your question is no, I do not think in my line of work related to general practice in mixed and small animal, prices are going to go down, nor do I think they should, because there is added value that is being provided for in this industry, which we are so horrible at showing at. And I think we have so much more opportunity to confer that value to the public. And I think, you know, as veterinarians, we don't want to get on our own. We're so good at what we do, and yet we don't sometimes show that. And it's not about the dollars. It really isn't. Because I have clientele that want to spend and want to spend well, and there's nothing wrong with that. They want to give you money, but they want the value that's associated with that as well too. I'd rather be in that game trying to be as efficient and best and quality because then I can also pay my team better. I can also buy in the equipment they need. I can also provide the CapEx needed in the buildings and the improvements, et cetera. Can't do that if you're only charging $20 or $30. I wasn't talking about specialty care. I wasn't talking about urgent care. Those are different businesses, which I've also been involved in. And in our case, we have to refer many times to tertiary care, to specialty care. There's a place where I think we've hit the limit. There's a place where I think there is enough pushback right now to say that specialty care in some instances, and there's many different services and businesses within specialty care, is overpriced. And it no longer feels good to send my clients that way when I know the value is not worth the dollar. Yeah, I get, I won. I got you on a soapbox before you got me on one. See, this is interesting. And now I'm just like extending this episode because when I'm in my thinking time, as we talked about, this is what I sit here wrestling with is the two competing forces of we are in, we all exist in an inflationary credit-based system. Prices generally go up and they're supposed to go up two-ish percent a year, but lately it's been quite a lot more than that. Versus technology, which by its nature is deflationary. And those are two competing forces against each other. So, I mean, and for those listeners that have read Jeff Booth's book, The Price of Tomorrow, fantastic book. I'm basically stealing this from him. But we have these two competing forces, right? And you look at TVs. We went and I was walking in Best Buy the other day and like, you can get a 52 inch awesome TV for like a couple hundred bucks now. Those used to be thousands of dollars. So that's an example of technology deflating the cost of stuff. And then on the other side, inflation, like you talked about, where you've got something bad happens to someone's pet family member and they have to go see a specialist and it's getting to the outer limits of, holy man, like how are people supposed to afford this? Because wages, generally speaking, there's always exceptions, but like this is a super broad brush. Wages aren't necessarily keeping up with that inflation. I agree. And there's a number of theories going on in veterinary medicine with some individuals that are speaking about it that, you know, maybe we're not in a veterinary shortage and veterinarians actually could be 300, 400% more effective and efficient in what they do. And I say, 
game on. Like that would be fantastic, except that our tools and our technology in the vet space is not there yet. And that's one of the places I'm most optimistic about. Heck, I like talking about that. There is lots of improvements still needed in veterinary medicine so that we can have the ability to potentially see more vets in, or pets in a shorter amount of time without burning out our team, without burning out our staff, which then could maybe lead to some deflation. But I'm not of the view that that's coming in the next six to 12 months. I think we also need to, will see moments and continue to really monitor and closely watch for those outside influences of which we have no idea how will affect the industry. Chewy did that in the States. Chewy's only coming up to Canada here, and they are meeting their own issues and their own walls right now based on interests and decreased capital and having to make profit, et cetera. But I think there are other pressures out there that could affect us, regulations, government, changing tides and theories within the world that, again, we need to be aware of. And that's my job. That's my thinking time is trying to strategize within the context of what's happening, whether it's within Western Canada, Alberta, Canada, the world. Japan. So there we go. That's my crystal ball on the vet industry for 2024. You got me. Right on. Okay. We're over time. Dude, it's a pleasure doing this podcast with you. Really enjoy it. We're coming to the end of 2023. Who would have thunk when we were thinking about this in 2020? Actually, who would have thunk it was us. It was you and me that said, hey, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it and be committed to it. We took a little break there in the summer, which ended up being, I think, a really nice change for us. And it's been fantastic coming back in the fall and being with you again. Yeah. Likewise, man. It's fun. And it's someone asked, why do you guys keep doing this? And it was actually one of the guests that's going to be on our podcast. And I was like, because we get to talk to people like you. It's awesome. This is my excuse to reach out to someone and chat for an hour about cool stuff. So one of our guests in the uh, spring, and it's the exact scenario, is I was asked to talk at a conference next year. And it actually, just by random chance, was the lady that I've been following on Instagram for a number of months now going, wow, I would love to have her on the podcast, but had no connection, wasn't going to creep out and reach out by DM, no attachment whatsoever. But then there, we've got now an email attachment relationship. She's going to be on our podcast next year. You couldn't ask for better. Yeah. Taking some chances. There we go. All right, buddy. I hope you have a fantastic afternoon. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Cheers. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.